Hi everyone, we're talking about side effects of using Wellbutrin, which is also known as Bupropion. So we're going to talk about side effects you want to look out for when using this medication. Before we talk about the side effects, let's talk about what Wellbutrin is and what it does. So Wellbutrin is in the class of medications known as norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors. It is a medication that inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. So it inhibits the reuptake of both of these types of neurotransmitters. So what happens is that you have two neurons. There's a presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron is the one that's going to release the neurotransmitters into a gap between the neurons known as a synapse. And then those neurotransmitters are going to bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So whether that be norepinephrine or dopamine, those neurotransmitters are going to enter into the synapse, that space in between those neurons. And then some of those neurotransmitters can bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And then whatever's left over in the synapse can be brought back up into the presynaptic neuron through what we call reuptake channels or reuptake pumps. So these reuptake pumps are going to be on the presynaptic neuron. They essentially suck up the neurotransmitters back into the presynaptic neuron. But this medication inhibits those reuptake pumps. So that's going to leave more norepinephrine and dopamine in the synapse and ultimately will lead to changes in the receptor number on the postsynaptic neuron. This is probably how this medication functions. However, having said all that, the exact underlying mechanism as to why Wellbutrin has its effects is not entirely understood. So this is likely a mechanism, but the entire mechanism as to how it works is not entirely known. Now it's used to treat a variety of health conditions. These include major depressive disorder and seasonal affective disorder. It's also used as a medication for smoking cessation, and it was known in a previous formulation as Zyban, but this has been discontinued. And also as an off-label use, it can be used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Now the problem with this medication is because it can increase levels of norepinephrine and dopamine in the synapse, it may cause a variety of mild and or severe side effects. And we're going to talk about those as we go through this lesson. Now let's talk about one of the most common side effects of Wellbutrin or bupropion use, and that is a headache. And this is often going to be a mild tension type headache. Oftentimes, again, it's going to be mild in severity. And it's usually an initial side effect of use. So once you start taking it, you can have this mild headache and it will usually resolve over time. However, some patients may have a migraine headache, which would be a unilateral pounding headache. And this can be associated with nausea and other symptoms as well. In some cases, these migraine headaches can be persistent. Migraine headaches are likely to affect approximately 1% to 4% of patients on Wellbutrin. But these more common mild tension type headaches are likely to affect up to a third of patients on this medication. Another very important side effect is dry mouth. This can be due to reduced salivation. This may be due to increased norepinephrine levels. So patients can have a dry mouth, dry tongue. And this can also be very common in patients. 17 to 20% of patients have been reported to have this side effect. And weight loss is also another common side effect of this medication. Patients can lose roughly 5 to 10% of body weight in as little as eight weeks. So this can be something that can be significant in some patients. It's been reported that it can affect anywhere from 15 to 20% of patients. And some other cases have noted up to two thirds of patients may have some weight loss on this medication. And then this has to do with anorexia or a loss or reduction of appetite. So this reduction of appetite is going to contribute to the weight loss. Patients just don't feel as hungry as they used to. And this is often due to dopamine-mediated suppression of appetite. And roughly 3 to 5% of patients will report having a loss of appetite. So a loss of appetite is likely a contributing factor to the weight loss and maybe some other mechanisms that could also be at play with regards to weight loss as well. Nausea is also another side effect. So this can affect up to 20% of patients. Vomiting can occur in fewer patients. Roughly 2% of patients can have vomiting. And this may also contribute to that weight loss we talked about before. Patients may feel nauseous. They may not want to eat. And then constipation can also be another finding we can see. So constipation is a decreased frequency of bowel movements. So going to the bathroom less often and or an increased consistency of stool. So it's stool type one to three on a bristle stool chart. So if you look at this chart here, this is the normal type of stool type four. And then type one, two, and three would be considered an increased consistency of stool. So this would be considered constipation. This affects roughly five to 10% of patients. And then diarrhea is also the other side effect that we can see as well. This is where there's an increased frequency of bowel movements and or decreased consistency of stool. So this is where we're going to see types five, six, and seven on the bristle stool chart. 
and this is going to affect roughly five to seven percent of patients affected. So patients can have either one of these or alternating of both. We can also see issues with abdominal pain. So this is going to be upper abdominal pain and more specifically epigastric pain, so pain in the epigastric area. This affects two to nine percent of patients. And then weight gain is also another finding we can see. So although we talked about weight loss being a common side effect of this medication, some patients can actually gain weight. This is, again, going to be less common, and roughly 4% of patients will report gaining weight. Dizziness is also something we can note as well. So feeling lightheaded, this may cause or worsen postural hypotension. So postural hypotension is when you stand up very quickly and you feel lightheaded. This can affect anywhere from 5 to 20% of patients. Insomnia can also occur as well. So insomnia is going to be issues falling asleep, staying asleep, or early morning awakening. This may be due to increased norepinephrine signaling, and it is going to affect 10 to 20% of patients. And then some patients can experience somnolence, so feeling very tired throughout the day. This can be associated with the insomnia, and roughly 2 to 3% of patients will report having somnolence. Anxiety and nervousness are also some important side effects that can occur with this medication. So it can cause worsening anxiety and feelings of nervousness. So it's going to occur, especially in patients who are prone to anxiety. So this is the reason why clinicians will often prescribe SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in patients with depression because depression and anxiety are so closely connected to each other. So if you're using Wellbutrin to treat depression, it's important to ensure that the patient doesn't have issues with anxiety. So if it's only an issue with isolated depression, this may be an important medication to use, but otherwise it can actually increase anxiety symptoms. This can affect approximately 3 to 5% of patients. And then we can also see agitation as well. So agitation, irritability, more likely in patients, again, who are prone to agitation. And reports are quite varied. It can affect anywhere from 2 to 32% of patients. Heart palpitations, we can see issues with feeling like your heart is skipping a beat. This may be related to norepinephrine signaling, and it's going to affect approximately 3 to 5% of patients. And then chest pain. Chest pain may be caused by the heart palpitations, or they may not, and this can occur in 3 to 6% of patients. Tremors can also occur, so feeling very shaky, your hands are having tremors, or feeling tremulous or trembling. This can occur in 3 to 6% of patients. So this can be associated with that anxiety and nervousness and agitation, all likely due to, again, increased norepinephrine signaling. And then tinnitus, tinnitus or tinnitus, this is going to be ringing or buzzing sound in the ears. It affects 3 to 6% of patients as well. Then pharyngitis is also another side effect. So pharyngitis is a sore throat and pharyngitis is an inflammation of the pharynx and it affects 3 to 13% of patients. And then there can be increased risk of infections in some patients as well, more specifically, likely upper respiratory tract infections. And some patients may describe feeling generally unwell, and there have been reports of leukocytosis or increased white blood cell count and fever in some patients as well. And the increased risk of infections or higher likelihood of having upper respiratory tract infections likely impacts 8 to 9% of patients. And then associated with this is sinusitis. Sinusitis is an inflammation of the nasal sinuses. So we can see a stuffy nose, a runny nose, sneezing. This may be related to the upper respiratory tract infections, and it affects 1% to 5% of patients as well. And then we can see myalgias. Myalgias are muscle aches and pains. This affects 2 to 6% of patients. And arthralgia and arthritis as well. This is joint aches and pains, affects 1% to 4% of patients. Some patients can also experience issues with sweating. So this can be more frequent and excessive sweating. Again, this is going to occur in 2 to 5% of patients. Some patients can experience a skin rash, so skin rash or redness of the skin. Some patients can have hives on the skin, and this affects 1 to 5% of patients. And then there can be skin flushing where the skin becomes very reddened and then can go away. This can occur in 1 to 4% of patients. Pruritus, which is an itching sensation, can also occur, maybe generalized, maybe related to the skin rash, and this also affects 2 to 4% of patients. Urinary frequency can also be something we can see. This is going to be increased frequency of urination. Patients may also have urinary incontinence. This has also been shown in some reports to cause urinary incontinence during sleep. Urinary incontinence is a loss of control of urination. And then this approximately affects 2% of patients. And then there can also be issues with vaginal hemorrhage. So this would be vaginal bleeding. This can also occur in 2% of patients as well. And some very important risks to talk about here at the end is seizure risk. So this can increase the risk of seizures with increasing dose. So it's a dose-dependent effect. The higher the dose of Welbutrin, the higher the likelihood of having seizures. And it also increases the risk of seizures if you're on other medications that are also increasing the risk of seizures. So they can both be additive and increase your risk overall. Generally speaking, 
the risk of seizures is going to be low. It's going to be around 0.4% or a bit higher than that. But again, if you're on higher doses of Welbutrin, you're at a higher risk for having seizures. So at some of the higher doses, you may have a risk of roughly 3%. And then another very important side effect we have to look out for is suicidal ideation. So suicidal ideation is going to be increased suicidal thoughts. This is going to be very particular with regards to younger patients. So children, adolescents, young adults, if they're less than 24 years old, this can increase the risk significantly. So it's very important to avoid using Welbutrin in these patient groups. So anybody less than 24 years old, you should not use this medication in those patients. And then there can be a slight decrease of suicidal ideation in those over 65 years old. So this is just a interesting point to make note of. If patients have suicidal ideation, if it's used in older patients greater than the age of 65, they may actually have a reduced suicidal ideation. And this is going to be the big warning with regards to this medication, this suicidal ideation. This is actually the black box warning for this medication. Please check my lesson on side effects of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And also, please check out my lesson on what to avoid if you're taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.